Uh, turn please to Ephesians chapter 6. My uh, message topic for this morning is titled, The Battle is On, and the text that we are going to examine is here in Ephesians chapter 6, a passage that I know is very familiar with so many of you here. Ephesians chapter 6, I will begin reading at verse 10, and I'm going to read on down through verse uh, 17 to 18, okay? Ephesians chapter 6, and beginning here at verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's pray. Our Father, once again, we do thank you for who you are as a God of goodness, a God of grace. We thank you, Father, for the provisions that you have made, the, the battle gear, the weaponry that you designed for the purpose of equipping us as we can engage in this spiritual warfare. May we do so uh, as good soldiers. May we do it with honor. May we do it because we have understanding uh, in regards to the tactics of the adversary. May we never be victimized by the cunning, crafty tactics that are launched against each and every one of us. May all things just truly uh, redound to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I think you're very much familiar with the fact that on a number of occasions, the Apostle Paul describes this spiritual conflict that is raging in the universe. There are times where Paul uses words like weapons. He talks about war. He talks about warfare. He talks about a good fight. He talks about being a good soldier. Without question, we know that there is raging on the planet, raging in the universe, this unseen cosmic conflict. And as we are studying this particular passage, what the Apostle Paul here is going to emphasize is the specific battle gear that God himself designed so that each and every one of us can literally resist the cunning satanic tactics that are launched against the church, the body of Christ. So the information that we're going to examine is grave. It's dire. Verse 10, finally, my brethren. Now, when Paul says finally, he isn't just simply drawing this letter to a close. I know that when you read the word finally, we assume that, well, maybe Paul is just sort of tying up some loose ends, and he's, he's bringing to a close this particular epistle. That isn't really what Paul is doing. When he says, finally, brethren, he does so five times, and he does it in four epistles. So there are nine epistles in which Paul doesn't say, finally, brethren, so we need to understand, well, well, wait a minute, why does he say finally? In fact, go to Philippians chapter 3 for a second. Paul uses that expression, finally, brethren, two times in one letter. Now that's rather odd, isn't it? How many times is he trying to bring to a letter or bring to a close a particular letter? Why would he do it twice in one epistle? See, we need to understand that the expression, finally, brethren, carries with it meaning that is far more than just, tell you what, here are a few more points that I want to throw at you. For example, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, finally, my brethren, and of course he says, rejoice in the Lord, to write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is, what, safe, verse 2, beware. 
Now, he's not drawing this letter to a close. How do we know that? Drop down to chapter 4. And notice what we read in chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, what? Brother, well, wait a minute. Paul, I thought you were bringing this thing to an end in chapter 3. Paul was not bringing it to an end. So here in chapter 4, verse 8, finally, brethren, and then he lists whatsoever, correct? So we need to recognize when Paul, go back to Ephesians chapter 6, when he uses that expression, finally, he's not merely informing the reader that we're coming to the end of the letter. He is emphasizing some information that is so important, so critically urgent that, that we should never dare reverse, rescind, revoke. We should never ignore nor dismiss the critical details that are going to be dealt with. You understand what Paul's doing here? Finally, the situation is so dangerous, the situation is so dire that to dismiss what is going to be dealt with is to your own peril. It's to your own spiritual destruction. And by the way, the five occurrences, finally, brethren, you, you study those five occurrences, and you're going to find out they all have something in common. It all has something to do with the spiritual conflict, the spiritual battle that the church today is involved with, okay? I, I challenge you, look at those five occurrences and you'll, you'll find some real interesting commonality, okay? So here we go, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now, for those of us who were here last evening, Brother John Verstegen, he began to cover some of the details regarding who we are in Jesus Christ. What we have in Jesus Christ, this living, loving, eternal union, this new identity, this new reality, this new position that we have where in Jesus Christ, not independent of Jesus Christ, here we're supposed to be strong in the Lord, that is, we're supposed to recognize, we're supposed to love, we're supposed to value our complete identity, our complete standing, our blessed relationship, our glorious, eternal, absolute, unconditional participation in all that God's going to do in the ages. To be strong in the Lord means be fully developed, grow, understand, be strong in your comprehension and in your understanding of all that you are, all that we have. Paul talks about those that are weak in the faith and then those that are strong, right? You see, to be strong in the Lord means, listen, we're growing, we're developing, we're accessing, utilizing, allotting the things that are freely ours because of God's grace. Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and notice, uh, chapter 2, by the way, and notice how the Apostle Paul in his last letter written to Timothy describes it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and notice there in verse 1, 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, Thou therefore my son. Now notice, be strong where? In the grace of oh, this unconditional, positive esteem and love and value and regard. God's grace is all that God has already done for us, regardless of what we deserve. That's what makes grace grace, right? God's grace has nothing to do with whether or not, you know, uh, he, He's going to love you when you don't deserve it. He's going to love you when you do deserve it. It has nothing to do with what you deserve, but it has everything to do with His innate capacity to respond because of who He is. And God is doing something, and He is making us something, and He has given to us something. Where? In Jesus Christ. And you know how we're strong in grace? Romans chapter 5 tells us that we have access 
by faith, into this grace wherein we what? Be strong. And by the way, Ephesians chapter 6, go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, Paul, four times, is going to say, stand, 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 withstand. Listen, we grow and develop into spiritual maturity, into a spiritual adulthood. We want to be strong, operating with this full, clear, enlightened understanding and comprehension of who am I really? So to be strong in the Lord is to access by faith the riches of God's grace to each and every one of us, okay? So Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. As Paul says it there in 2 Timothy, strong in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be fully developed. Continue in and through this edification so that we love and we seize upon who we really are. Not in the energy of our own flesh or our past identity in Adam, but who we really are, where in the sight of Almighty God. And that is, we're rich in Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, with that in mind, and of course, Paul says in verse 10, and in the power of His might. You notice there in chapter 3, Paul said something about this, this power of His might. He says there in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the... Oh, if we're going to be strong in the Lord, we got to tap into this strength that is available in the realm of the inner man, this sustaining, fortified attitude that we have why do we need to do that why is it absolutely critical to be strong and to tap into this spiritual power now go back to chapter 6 verse 11 you know battle warfare isn't for the young it isn't for the children battle is intended for those who have grown up a little bit. We we don't send 10-year-olds to battle. Unless you're some deluded maniac in absolute sheer desperation, you start sending children to the front lines to be literally slaughtered. That has happened in human history. You know, God said you never send somebody to battle if they're less than 20 years old. There was was an age. Now, interestingly enough, I I was in the Air Force when I was 17 years old. I mean, you hear about guys in World War II, they were 16 years old, you know? You know, God would not allow anyone younger than 20 years of age to engage in battle. Battle is not for children, although the word infantry, the word infant tree, you know what culture has done? They send the children off. They send the infant, infant tree. That isn't, how, that isn't God's design. You know, God wants the strong those who are accessing grace, those who are utilizing the inner man's strength, those are the ones, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Put it on. Wait a minute. How how do you put on something? Remember what Paul says in chapter 4? Go to chapter 4 and notice there in verse 24. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, and that ye... Put on the what? The the new man? How do you put on the new man? Well, keep reading. Verse 25. Um, I'm sorry, verse 23. Look at verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man. You know how you put on the, by the way, in the context, doesn't he say to put off? Uh, the, the old one. Look at verse 22. That ye put off. And then verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, you what? Put on. To put on something means we have to renew our understanding. We have to renew our thinking. 
So if we are tapping into the spiritual strength, we're enjoying the riches of God's grace, we're strong, we now, by way of renewed thinking, we have to put on the mental battle armor, the mental battle gear. It has everything to do with the way we understand some things. In fact, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, so to put something on simply means we got to start thinking like this. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And the reason for that is the theater of battle has to do with what you understand, what, what I understand, what I am thinking, the way I perceive, the way I view life, what is my perspective. And a good soldier of Jesus Christ has to put on, by way of renewed thinking, a proper understanding, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Is it any wonder why he says what he says here in verse 3? For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, notice verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know what it means to be strong, fully developed, being spiritually mature, acting like an adult? It means... We put on this clear, spiritual, enlightened understanding of what's really happening today. And we don't operate based upon these imaginations. We don't guess and think that God is doing this or doing that. You know that the majority of Christians, don't they imagine God doing all sorts of crazy things? Yeah. That's, that's imagination. You think God's doing something. And then you know what it means? Every high thing in the context, it has to do with your own personal human view, your own wisdom. You know what the weapons of our warfare? Listen, there are some tactical implements of war specific to the type of warfare that we find ourselves in. And it has to do with tearing down what we think about God and recognizing we have a responsibility to bring how many of our thoughts into captivity? Every thought. See, this this, is kind of high ground, you know? But if anything, it's the battle of what? The mind, okay? Now go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Keep going through this passage. Ephesians chapter 6. So we're told, verse 11, to put on. Again, we we understand we got to renew our thinking. We put on, verse 11, the whole armor of God. Why? That ye may be able to stand against. Four times Paul uses that word stand, stand, stand. The idea of standing against something. Look there at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to, what is this? withstand you know what God is saying there's a raging battle and we must put on renewed understanding so that we can successfully and effectively resist and oppose what Satan is doing today and he is active he's on duty Larry Brown we're talking about Larry Brown right Larry Brown he's a sergeant uh, U.S. Army, okay, and he's not here this weekend. Uh, a couple of Sundays ago, he's here wearing his camouflage. He's wearing his uh, I, fatigues camel, right? And I asked Larry, Larry, are you on duty? He said, yeah, I'm on duty. Right after the meetings, he had to do something, okay? On du- you, you know the adversary? He's on duty 24-7. He's on duty. And in light of that, God's armor is designed so that we can effectively resist and oppose, what does verse uh, 11 say? That ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles of the devil. Oh, what a study. Go to Joshua chapter 9. Joshua chapter 9 
is a, a, a fascinating study on this tactic, the wiles, being wily. You remember Wiley Coyote, right? <laughs> I don't call him wily. I call him an idiot. I mean, the guy, you know, he's kind of a stupid coyote. But, but you understand, wily. You know, remember he would set up traps and snares. And, you know, the roadrunner, he was a little bit wiser and so on. So you understand the concept of being wily? Joshua chapter 9 paints a very important picture of the use of wily tactics. In fact, Joshua 9 has some parallels to what Satan is doing today, and maybe we'll touch on some of those parallels. Okay? But, but in Joshua chapter 9, here, understand what's going on here. God is leading the military campaign, leading Israel into the promised land, and he is, he is removing, he is defeating, he is destroying. He is conquering the various Gentile nations that are occupying the promised land, all right? And by the way, Israel is, is being successful because of the mighty arm of the Lord, okay? So here comes this military campaign, a bunch of ragtag Jews with no real military experience, by the way. And all of a sudden, they're wiping out all these battle-hardened Gentile armies, okay? Okay? So one of these nations, they decide, wait a minute, wait a minute, guys, if we launch a frontal attack against Israel, we're decimated, we're wiped out. So what do they now strategize? We're not going to go through all these. Verse 4, now this is the, the inhabitant, verse 3. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, Ai verse 4, they did work how? Wily. Now remember, the battle armor that God has designed for you and I. By the way, God says put it on, right? He doesn't say create it. He doesn't say figure out how you're going to defend. He doesn't say design it. He says what? Put it on. That means it's already available, right? See, it, the, the battle armor designed for specific warfare. By the way, if you're familiar with the military, hey, listen, you know, there's such a thing as a ground war. There's such a thing as submarine warfare. There's such, there's such a thing as an air campaign. You know, and, and you know the difference. You don't use weaponry that is designed and intended for a ground war when you're dealing with submarines. You understand, right? So the point there in Ephesians chapter 6 is th this is specifically designed armor and battle gear God has designed for a very specific theater of battle. And God says, just what? Put it on. You know, that's sort of a relief. <laughs> All I got to do is put it on. How do we put it on? Remember? By the renewing of your mind, okay? Now, we're supposed to do it because of the wiles of the devil. Now, these inhabitants, verse 4, and they did work wily and went and made as if they had been ambassadors. Okay? And then you read the rest of the story, and what they're going to do is they're going to, they're going to say, hey, uh, Israel, uh, we, we want you to make a league. With, can't we just get along? Can't we just get along? You know, why, 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 why you guys kind of cause problems? And, and you know what? Let's, let's focus on the things we agree with, and let's not, you know, emphasize the things that we might not agree. You know, we, we got to, uh, let's just have peace. That's the kind of league they want, right? Peace. At what cost? Now, you, I want you to just a couple of points. You know what these, got, these imposters portraying themselves to be what? Ambassadors. You know what they claim? Look there at verse 8. And they said unto Joshua, we are thy what? We're here to help you. We want to serve you. Now, they're frauds, right? In fact, these guys, th these are special forces, by the way. You're not going to send a bunch of children. These guys are special forces that are now infiltrating the camp of Israel, portraying themselves to be something they are not. And they come and they say, let's have some, let's make a league. Let's get along. Let's have a pact. And you know what? We're here to help. We're here to serve you. I want you to understand, Satan's wily, isn't he? 
Uh, just keep that in mind. We're here. To, we're on your side. Now check this out, verse 9. And they said unto him, From a very far country, thy servant. You notice how he keep. we're your servants. We're not against you. We're, we're, we're on your side. We want to help. We want to aid. We want to serve. We're your servants are come because, now this, because of the name of the Lord thy God. You understand what the prerequisite was? For Gentiles to participate in what God was doing on planet Earth? What did they have to do? You've got to believe that there is only, there is one God, and whose God is it? Israel. Remember Rahab? She said, we don't. Rahab was a believing Gentile. Now, God did not have direct dealings with Gentiles, right? But what was the Abrahamic covenant all about? Them that bless thee? These guys know the Abrahamic covenant. They know what the Abrahamic covenant said. I, I know, I'm, I'm, I, you know why they want to make a league? Because God prevented Israel from making leagues and, and, and peace treaties with the immediate inhabitants of the promised land. They know that. That's why they come. We want to serve you. Let's make a league. They know that's not what God wants. They know that their God is the God of Israel. Do you understand the wiles of the devil? Listen, I believe in your God. I'm a believer. They, these, these frauds are, are literally saying, we believe in the name. We believe in him. We know something about the name of the Lord. And you know what that begins to do with Israel? I said, whoa, wait a minute. That, you know what? That's what the Abrahamic covenant says. Now, they made a grave error, Israel. Go down to verse 14. And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. Oh, boy. You see, they operated by sight. They began to think about, well, what does the Abrahamic covenant say? Listen, we got some Gentiles, they want to serve us. And they acknowledge that we are the true people of God, that there is only one God of the universe, and he belongs to Israel. That's exactly how Gentiles were expected to participate. That's what Rahab did. Now, long story short, they were found out. Drop down to verse 22, and Joshua called for them and spake unto them, saying, Wherefore have ye what? Beguiled us. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Just keep, keep that in mind. What these imposters did, they portrayed themselves to be something they were not. They believed in, quote, the Lord. They offered to be Israel's servant. And you know what their agenda was? To infiltrate and destroy from the inside out. And you know what they failed to do? Did they appeal to the counsel of the Lord? Now go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen, when Paul talks about the wiles of the devil... We know some things about the cunning, deceptive tactics of our of God's great adversary. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says, watch out. There are going to be people to claim to represent God. For example, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through a son. Do you understand that Satan in Genesis chapter 3, when he appealed to Eve, he in effect presented himself as Eve's best friend. You know, the greatest humanist on planet Earth is Satan. Humanist in the sense that I'm here for you. I want you to be liberated from some absentee God who simply wants you to serve him in slavish fear. And what did Satan as the serpent in his subtlety convince Eve? Why don't you be your own God? I'm your friend. I'm your friend. So we understand, and, and that, by the way, is why Paul 
takes us back to Genesis 3. I fear, lest by, uh, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled. Remember in Gen- Joshua 9, they were wily, and then Israel says, why did you beguile? Beguile. Paul uses language like bewitch. He uses language like seduce. He uses language like entice. He uses language like, uh, like beguile. Good words, fair speeches. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, man, he slipped. So you're, uh uh-oh, what? Where's the battle? The theater of battle is where? Oh, how am I assessing and evaluating, interpreting the context of my circumstances? How am I properly going to respond? You see, where does it begin? Women. He, that, so that your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Look at verse 4. For he that cometh preacheth another who? Jesus. Hey, listen. Satan's got no problem preaching Jesus. Whom, now notice, Paul, you see the condition here? Whom we have not preached. Listen, we're going to have to, we'll, we'll identify. It. Jesus was preached in such a way that Paul never preached him that way. If, if somebody comes and preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which we have not, uh, ye have not received, or another what? Listen, those frauds in Joshua chapter 9, they are infiltrating the nation of Israel. They say, we're on your side. We want to serve you. We believe in your God. Let's just get along. You know what the tactic, the wily craftiness of the adversary is he's on your side nothing wrong with jesus there's nothing wrong with the spirit there's nothing wrong with the gospel drop down to verse 13 for such are false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of who wait a minute how do they present themselves as spokesmen as representatives as apostles of who Jesus Christ. They go to the seminaries. They go to the Bible colleges. They study the theology. Hey, we're on your side. Now look at verse 14. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of what? He's on your side. Light. I'm going to provide to you liberating revelation and enlightenment that will free you to be your own God, ultimately. And, some, and, and those tactics involve his strategy. Go back to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Understand, when Paul talks about the wiles of the devil, listen, he's cunning, he's crafty, he's subtle, he's slick. Like a serpent, he just slithers along. Just like a serpent. You know what he does? Look there in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. Ephesians 4, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children. That's the idea. Listen, don't be, don't be weak in the faith. Be strong in the Lord. That henceforth we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness. Listen, you know what it means to be a craftsman? They are, they are master craftsmen. They are devising these deceptive schemes to entrap, whereby they lie in wait Did you catch that? They lie in what? You know, Satan's a very patient man. His ambassadors, his ministers of righteousness, they're very patient, insidious. They lie how? In wait. And at the right moment, and we're going to find out at what moment are they ready to strike like the serpent. Just waits, just waits. Go back to Ephesians 6. That's why Paul says, we're going through it. This is why Paul says what he says here. In, in Ephesians 6, verse, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the, the wiles of the devil. He's tricky, crafty, subtle. He's an imposter. As an angel of light, he's going to try to convince you that, listen, the, the theology that I'm confronting you with is for your ultimate good and spiritual benefit. And he's got a whole core of false teachers, false preachers, and they're preaching Jesus, they're preaching the Spirit, and they're preaching the gospel, right? 
But you know what their goal is? I ask you to Ephesians 6. Just go to Galatians chapter 1. You, you understand why would the angel of light as a source of illumination, a source of revelation, a source of spiritual enlightenment, why is he interested in preaching another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel? Oh, you know why? This is it. This is his goal. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. Galatians 1, verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed. Now, Paul four times. What does he say? Stand, stand, stand. What's the opposite of standing, maintaining your fixed position? How do, Satan's not going to come along with a bat. He's not going to come along and try to push you. He's slick. Good words, fair speeches, using theological lingo, false message. I marvel you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ onto another what? There's the wily tactics. Satan's ultimate objective is to move the believer away and off the, the place and position that God exhorts us, stand. Stand where? Now go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 12, okay? Verse 12, for we wrestle not against... A, you know what it means to wrestle, right? And, and by the way, the wrestling in this... Con Paul depicts a Roman probably a Roman, a soldier. And of course, when he depicts this soldier, doesn't he have battle armor on? Now, Paul, why does he use the word wrestle in verse 12? Paul doesn't take us in the field of battle with a soldier equipped with all of this battle gear, including the sword and so forth, and then transport us all the way back to Greece in the gymnasium to watch a wrestling match. When Paul says wrestle, you understand, wrestle in hand-to-hand -hand conflict. What Paul is describing here is not wrestling. Now, don't get me wrong. I hated wrestling, you know. I don't like wrestling. I like other sports. But you know what it means to wrestle, right? You know, balance. You want to overbalance, overpower. You want to maintain leverage. You want to have your opponent in a position so that when he is off balance, wham, you throw him and you pin him. Now that's in the sport of wrestling. In battle, what Paul is describing is hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's a struggle for life and death. You know what it means for uh, two enemy soldiers to... Why are they wrestling? One's going to die, one's going to live. One of the best accounts of battle, uh, it's titled, it's a book titled The Eastern Inferno. It was written by a German soldier, World War II, and he kept a diary illegally. He was not allowed to keep a diary, but, you know, as some soldiers do, they don't always follow orders, so he kept a diary. And he, of course, was on the Eastern Front when uh, Germany, you know, they were launching the, uh, uh, the armies and so forth against the Red Army, right, Russia. And, and some of the most bloodiest, most brutal, some of the, the most horrible atrocities committed happened on the Eastern Front. And this guy was a frontline infantryman. He witnessed the atrocities. And, and oh, the book is a little graphic, describes some of the ho horrible atrocities committed. Okay? He, he, he writes how often, and, and you have to understand a little bit about the fighting between the Red Army and Germany, back and forth, back and forth. He said sometimes when they would enter into a village and occupy it or reoccupy it, he said he would describe how he would find a dead German soldier and a Russian soldier locked, arms wrapped around each other, hands around each other's throat, but they're both dead. Now, you know what happened. They're literally, they, they, they run out of ammo, and then they resort to what? almost a tribal, animalistic survival for life. And listen, it's not a pretty picture. You got teeth over there. You got, you know, listen, you know, you know what's happening if you're trying to stay alive. You're gouging. You're pulling. You're twisting. You're holding. You're breaking. You're choking. You're, you, 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 you want to stay alive. Paul says, having done all. Now, you see why Paul says, 
Listen, if you're in a life and death struggle, hand-to-hand combat with another enemy soldier, you do everything to stay alive. There are no rules. Nobody can cry foul. There's no ref. If it means yanking eyeballs out, you know, I don't want to get graphic. But you understand what, you see, when Paul there, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, for we wrestle hand-to-hand combat, engaged in all sorts of fighting. But now look at this, for we wrestle not against, you know what's surprising here? It, what's surprising isn't what Paul's going to affirm. You know what's surprising here? Paul's, what's surprising is what Paul's going to deny. He says in verse 12, we wrestle not against who? Now, I want you to understand. What, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 again. This really is pretty difficult. You know why? Look there at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul says this death struggle. Now, of course, we're talking about spiritual. We're not talking about whether you're going to heaven or hell. Please understand that. We're talking about spiritual health spiritual life, life for the message of grace and life for your own personal edification, life for your own spiritual health. And, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look there at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant. Now notice, in stripes. Who laid stripes on Paul's back? Flesh and blood, Right? In stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Verse 24, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, right? Is that flesh and blood? Trice was I beaten. Is that flesh and blood? With rods. Once was I stoned. You go back to Acts, he was literally stoned to death. Listen, did he experience the the bloodlust mobs? You remember in the book of Acts, there was a group that said, they took a vow, they shaved their head, and they said, we're not going to eat until we slaughter this guy. Wait a minute. In the, in, the, in the eyes of the flesh, doesn't it seem like he was wrestling with who? Flesh and blood? They're beating me. They're whipping me. They're stoning me. And all, and all of that. You know what Paul says? But I'm not fighting these guys. That's not my, I wrestle not with these guys that are trying to extract a pound of flesh. And by the way, there is evidence that Paul was so severely beaten. Remember he talks about, I bear in my body the marks. Listen, he carried with him the scar. You you don't get stoned without, read read Eastern, uh, the the, uh, Eastern Inferno, and and man, again, atrocities. So, Paul, it's, it, to me, it's just amazing. He says, but that's not, I'm not fighting with these guys. You ever wonder why Jesus Christ, he opened not his mouth? You know, as they, they embedded those three-inch thorns into his scalp, and these Roman soldiers were pounding his face until cheekbones are, cr- I mean, battered. He was marred above any man. And then they start flaying him. And you understand the atrocities, right? Jesus Christ, he, he was like a sheep to what? You know why? I'm not fighting with flesh and blood. Uh, to me, that, that, that's kind of hard. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. You see, you and I, we take things rather personally. Somebody attacks, somebody assaults, somebody mocks, somebody scorns, somebody attacks, you know? And all of a sudden, we're engaged in battle with him. And you know what Paul says? Listen, the battle isn't with the human agent. You know who the battle really is with? Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle hand-to-hand combat, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You ever wonder why Jesus kept his mouth shut? You ever wonder why Paul says, listen, I've been beaten more than anybody else? And Paul says, I glory in my infirmities. Listen, somebody beats me, it's hard to glory in my infirmities unless you understand that's not my battle. I'm engaged in mortal combat with the upper echelons of this spiritual campaign 
and the tactics of deception and beguiling through vain, enticing words. The issue isn't my wealth. It isn't my physical comfort. It isn't my well-being. You know, Paul was sort of, he was sort of nuts if you think about it. How can anybody say, I glory in mine infirmities? Because his eyes were focused on the spiritual reality. Listen, the battle is where? In the heavenly places. Now, there are some who insist that verse 12, the principalities, powers, and so forth, it's talking about civil authorities and civil governments. Come on. Our battle is not with the Republicans, not with the Democrats, not with the Tea Party, not with the conservatives, not with the socialists, not with the liberals. Man, there are so many that are consumed in the here and the now and the governmental magistrates and the human institution of government. That's not where the battle is. Boy, Satan's pretty good at getting the believer to fight battles that Satan's not really fighting. Well, what are they? What, what are, who are these principalities and powers? Real quick, chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3. And, and listen, the real battle is against angelic forces. Ephesians chapter 3. Remember we hear what Paul says in verse um, 10? Look at verse 10. To the intent that now unto principalities and powers on earth, where are they? In heavenly places, please understand, we are not wrestling with flesh and blood. And as hard as your life might be, always remember the real battle is spiritual in nature. It's an invisible, unseen conflict, and it's launched against these operatives. There are principalities, there are powers that are occupying the very realm in which you and I are going to live out the life of Christ. How dare they occupy my house? Wait a minute, aren't we seated in heavenly places? I know, wait a minute, seated, but wait, we're still here, right? You know, as far as God's concerned, what is for you and I a future expectation is in the sight of God an accomplished fact. You see, God says, you're already seated there. Well, what are these guys doing? They're holding on in desperation. They understand what God is doing. And these powers, go back to chapter 6, chapter 6, and uh, verse uh, 12 again. Uh, listen, these are principalities, they're powers. That, now, where, where are they? They're in the heavenly places, right? Now, notice Paul says, against the rulers of the what? The darkness. Darkness. Go to chapter 4. Look there. Cha- what do you mean dark? You know what darkness represents? Ignorance. You know what Satan, what his slyly, wily, cunning tactic is to keep you ignorant. Okay? Now, now there's some verses in the Old Testament. You know, God promised Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus Christ is going to do when he returns to establish his reign on earth? Isaiah says that he's going to remove the veil, the covering from all the Gentile. You know what that covering is? It's the suffocating blanket of ignorance. The rulers of darkness is a reference to spiritual ignorance. You know, Satan's been pretty successful in Christendom, hasn't he? Come on. God would have all men to be saved and come on to the what? And if you don't come on to the knowledge of the truth, you're operating based upon ignorance whether it's your own imaginations, whether it's based upon high things, whether it's based upon false doctrine, Satan's master plan is to keep God's people spiritually ignorant. That's what the rulers of darkness are all about. Suppression of truth. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding, what? Darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. You see what the rulers of darkness are all about? The rulers of darkness, they are the ones who orchestrate all of the sophisticated theological systems, the false Jesus, the false spirit, the false gospel to keep God's people 
But we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, right? Don't say you're stupid. <laughs> don't do that. But we understand. We have brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ that are operating in the realm of sheer spiritual ignorance. They've been victimized, ensnared by the master tactician, the cunning, they're lying in wait, and they're promoting ignorance. Not ignorance because of some fabricated uh, system of, but, you know, not some Hindu, some mystic, new age, metaphysical way. Uh, you know how Satan keeps God's people ignorant from truth? Now, we got to develop that. Go back to chapter 6. For the time remaining, I, I, I'm going to just draw this out as quickly as I can. Uh, verse 13. Now, look, notice verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you. Wait a minute. Didn't Paul in verse 11 tell us, say, put on? Now, understand it. Verse 11, put it on. Right? Put on the whole armor. Well, then why in verse 13 does he say, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor? How do you take something that you already put on? He's not saying take it as in receive it or accept it. Wait a minute. If I put it on, it's on, right? Then he says, take it onto you. You know what he's saying? You seize it and you grab it with tremendous tenacity. Don't let these pieces of armor come off. Take it onto you. That's what Paul's saying here. That's the idea of, 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 of taking. It means you lay hold on it. Don't let one piece be left to the side. Under any circumstance. You, you under, why? This is a hand-to-hand -hand conflict, isn't it? Oh, isn't it easy to put down, and we'll talk about this. Listen, how long can you hold up a shield? And for those, uh, we never, we, we, in, in modern warfare, we don't wear, uh, we don't have shields in the sense that a Roman soldier had, you know. You can only carry battle gear for so long. It starts to weigh on you, correct? So you know what the, the tendency is, whether it's through fatigue, whether it's through uh, uh, intimidation, whether it's through distraction, you, you put it on and, and you got to do, we have to do more. We got to take it. We got to seize it. Don't let it fall off. Verse 13, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to, here we go again, withstand. You've got to resist this guy in the what? Listen, this is the evil day. Why is it evil? Who is occupying the heavenly places right now? You see those spiritual wickedness. This is his day. This is Satan's day. This is a present evil what? World. Listen, we've been dropped into enemy territory. We're not his friend. <laughs> And he's not our friend. Although as an angel of light, what, is he, what does he impersonate? I'm your bud. I'm here to help you. Okay, remember that. That's the wily tactic, okay? And, and here we go. And having done all, well, what are we supposed to do? Put it on. Hold on to it. Take it on. You access the strength and the power of his might. You, would say, you see, having done all, this life or death kind of concept. And what is the goal? To what? Stand. You see, remember what we read in, in Galatians chapter 1? I'm, I'm, I marvel that ye are so soon removed. Remember what Paul says to the Colossians? He says, listen, if ye be not moved away, what are we supposed to do? Stand. Stand. Now, let's just real quickly, how do we do this? Verse 14, stand therefore. Paul now is going to list six specific pieces of battle gear. And by the way, there is a very natural uh, division. There are two categories of, of armor. All right? and, and by the way, we know there are two categories. How do we know that? Look at verse 14. Uh, stand therefore, verse 14, notice, having, you see that? Having, it's already on, right? I have shoes on. I have a jacket. So the idea is you have on this, uh, your loins girt about, if you allow me to call it a belt, okay? Uh, you don't mind if I say I call it a belt. <laughs> you understand the concept, have your loins girt about. The loins, by the way, according to Peter, it's the loins of what? Here we go again, your mind. Listen, you have on the belt of truth, right? but you have it on. Listen, I got the belt on, right? I got my shoes on. I got my, uh, I got a, how much effort is there right now? Because I have the shoes, I have the, the jacket, and I have the belt. 
I can sleep on it. I can eat. I can. So the first three pieces, Paul says, you have it on, right? Having your loins girt about with truth. You having on the breastplate of righteousness. Verse 15, and, and your feet. In addition to that, you have your boots on, your combat boots. Now look at verse 16. Above all, so you see there's a natural break now. By the way, above all, not because these three pieces are more important than the first three pieces. Above all, in the sense that these three remaining pieces can be easily set aside. Above all, taking. Now, you see, Paul doesn't say having. He says what? Taking. Taking what? The shield of of faith. You see, the shield, you have to pick it up. You don't eat with a shield. You don't sleep with a shield necessarily. You you know what I'm saying. So so the idea is, listen, you already have on the boots. You already have on the belt. You already have on the belt. But now you've got to take up the shield. You're supposed to put on the helmet. Above all, because it's easy. You, You take the helmet off to sleep. And then you have the sword. The sword, by the way, is not in a scabbard. The sword uh, is to be wielded. Listen, if you're wrestling, if you're engaged in hand-to-hand conflict, what do you do with the shield? What do you do with the sword? After a while, don't you grow faint? Don't you get tired? You see why Paul says, above all, it's so easy to lay these three pieces down. Again, not because they're more important, but because you put them on. So, so you have the shield, and you have the sword, and you're using that sword. And you know what? Even if it's a six-pound sword after a while, you see what's going on? So you have a natural break. You have a natural division between these two categories. Let me just point this out. The first three pieces, very quickly, uh, having loins girt about with what? Truth. What truth is Paul talking about? Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, notice verse 21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in who? Question. Verse 21. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him. Did Jesus Christ ever teach Gentiles? Ah, good question. Trick question, I guess. When Jesus Christ was on planet Earth, did he ever teach Gentiles? Wait a minute. How how were the Ephesians taught? By who? By the Apostle Paul. But Paul says, if you've heard who and have been taught by who? You know what Paul's talking about? It's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the... Okay, real quick. First piece of armor... Your loins, your, 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 your loins being girded about with truth. Satan wants to move us from something and remove us to something, okay? Question number one, he wants to remove us from the mystery. Well, what other alternative is there in the scriptures? There we go. So get, guess what? Guess what? The adversary in his wily, cunning craftiness preaching another who? Jesus, according to the prophetic program. I'm on your side. An angel of light. Let's crack open the scriptures as the good theologian that Satan is. And he's a very good theologian, right? Remember the audacity? Hey, it's written over here. It's written over there. God's, you see that? You see that? So wait a minute. You know what Paul's saying is? Listen, there are three pieces of armor that involve the edification and it it, it deals with the message the first one is of course this the truth and then you put on the breastplate of what okay Uh, when it comes to righteousness i mean this is an obvious one are we made righteous by the law or by grace so what would satan have us do he would move us away from grace and what is the alternative to grace in the scriptures there you go Is law a legitimate Bible system? So what does this fraudster do with his ministers of righteousness? Okay. He's going to try to move us away from grace and move us to what? The law. And then Paul talks about the the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of what? We'll go to Ephesians chapter 2. Doesn't Paul say something about peace? Look there in Ephesians chapter 2. And look there. Uh, remember verse 11 and verse 12, this distinction and time passed between circumcision and uncircumcision? Look at verse 13. But now 
In Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for He is our, what? Peace, who have made both. You ever wonder why it's the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel? How many feet do most normal people have? Two. He made both. Both who? Jew and Gentile. What? One, so making what? Ah, So you know what that third piece of armor has to do with when you have those combat boots on? It has something to do with God creating a new man. And isn't that what he describes it right there in verse 15? For to make of himself in twain, you see, of twain what? One new man, the new creature. Listen, in the scriptures, we have this new agency, this new man, this new creature called what? Well, what other alternative is there in the Bible? Israel, do you understand what the wily tactics of the adversary are? Get you away from mystery truth and operate under prophetic truth. Get you away from the unconditional grace, righteous, and get us back under a self-righteous system of performance management. You know what Satan's tactic is? Listen, wait a minute, what is this new creature? Listen, I, I, anyway. People respond very negatively when you dare suggest that God has a new creature today. Uh, What do you mean? Uh, Paul talks about the true Israel of God, right? The next piece of armor, um, which is, again, he says, above all, taking the shield of what? Okay, what other alternative is there to faith? Who can quote 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7? We walk by... So what does Satan and his tactic? He listen, don't operate by what God's word says. Listen, you live your life based upon the way you interpret and evaluate the context of your circumstances, right? You respond by what you feel. You respond by what you think. You respond by what you... When God says, faith cometh by hearing, and by the word of God, right? So what's the wily tactic of the devil? You can trust your eyes and your ears and your intuitive capacity, right? Satan's goal is you put that shield down, which, by the way, is intended to what? To quench the fiery what? What are the fiery darts? Remember what what Paul says to Timothy? He talks about those who have their conscience seared with a what? False doctrine. Listen, there's false doctrine that begins to stir even in our circle of fellowship. Those are fiery, false doctrine. What are we supposed to do? The shield of faith. What saith God's word, basically, right? And then after the shield of faith, we're supposed to put on that helmet. uh, And and you know what that helmet has to do with hope? Well, according to Scripture, what's the alternative to hope? Despair. Fear. Shame. See, the tactics of the devil is, hey, I don't want you living with hope and we don't have any time to look at this. He wants us to to succumb to shame. Tribulation work of patience, patience experience, and experience what? Hope. And hope maketh not what? You know, saints, take that helmet off. What kind of hope is that? You you understand what I'm getting at, right? And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is what? Shit Satan's tactic is for us to take that helmet off. Don't operate under this confident, future absolute expectation. He wants you to succumb to fear, to be shaken and troubled. Everybody gets all freaked out, you know. Oh, no, Putin, and, you know, Antichrist and so on and so forth. And then, of course, the, the, the last piece of, of battle gear is what? The the Word of God, right? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, right? What other alternative is there besides God's Word? Your own human wisdom. That's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. So, in short, listen, if we're going to resist, if we're going to engage in hand-to-hand combat, God has already designed these specific doctrines for the purpose of renewing our mind. So we understand the tactic is he wants to get us away from mystery. Get the church operating under prophetic truth. Move us away from grace. Get us to operate under that system of bondage the law. Get us not to identify with the church of the body of Christ to get us to live like a bunch of Israelites. Boy, I got a lot of friends and relatives. They think they're spiritual Jews. And believe me, you want to go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and try to live out that doctrine? You're saying you're a spiritual Jew. It's simple. 
He, he wants you to stop. Don't operate by faith. You are better at determining what's best for you. Hope? Come on. Succumb to shame, ridicule, fear, so on and so forth. Word of God, put that sword down. And you know what? Human wisdom is as authoritative as what God has to say. That's what Satan would trick us into thinking. Father, we do thank you for your love, your love that not only provides redemption and salvation and eternal life as a free gift, but your love that provides specific battle gear so that we can resist and withstand the onslaught of deception. May we put on these pieces of armor and may we take it and seize it and never relinquish, not one piece under any circumstance. We thank you, Father, that we are more than conquerors through him. May we access it, and we do thank you, of course, in Christ's name.